So it took us over a year to really understand the market incredibly well, to understand the gaps in the market, to understand the different players, their relationships to each other, their intentions and their incentive structures. And in doing so, helping to find the gap and try to connect the dots. We knew the problem which we wanted to solve. We just didn't know how to solve it whatsoever because how do you reach these sort of entrepreneurs at grassroots level who are doing great work at scale and at low enough cost? There's a reason why there was a pioneer gap and it still remains unfilled at that point of time because nobody could crack that market. Nobody knew how to reach them and find out whether they're genuine, whether they're really impactful, whether or not they're financially sustainable. You know, these social entrepreneurs don't need much capital. They need anything where between, you know, five to $200,000 and that's it. And it's just not worth the due diligence costs to source for these social entrepreneurs and to find them. But they're also some of the most incredible solutions. And so it was really a blue ocean for us, really there for the taking, but nobody else could crack it. And we did not know how to crack it at all. Hello everyone, my name is Din Long and welcome to the podcast Lifeline. In this podcast, I will interview people who are having a positive impact in their community and have a strong message that deserves to be shared. We will dive deeper into their journey becoming a change maker and hopefully you can take away some insights for your own journey. And please do subscribe to Lifeline on YouTube, Apple Podcasts or any platform that you are using. And also you can share this episode with your friends if you like it. It's really what helps me the most. Edward is a social entrepreneur from Singapore who is passionate about financial inclusion. He co-founded Gift Funds to amplify the impact of innovators that are traditionally left behind. He shares with us his long journey understanding his purpose, startup after startup, trip after trip, train after train, and his long journey from struggling in primary school to completing two master degrees at Oxford University. We discuss why he stopped a successful startup that did not fit his purpose, how he turned dyslexia into a strength during his childhood, and he shares with us the innovative model of gift funds to identify and support grassroots innovators. Enjoy this conversation with Edward, who is, according to his own words, a misfit who has served trains in Bangladesh, got treated to beers by transgender sex workers in Vietnam, and partied in Mexican cartel villages. See you in one hour and 30 minutes. All right. Hello, Edward. Hello, Ed. I don't know why hey. I, call, I just called you Ed. I never did that before. <laughs> but hello, Edward. Um, I'm really happy, really excited to have you on Lifeline today. Um, so I always start by reminding a bit how I know the guests, uh, if I know them. And yeah, with you, it's actually very interesting because we met, we almost met in an Indian train. Uh, we just <laughs> met next to the Indian train. So during the Jagreti Yatra, so which is this, crazy Indian train journey across India uh, to meet social entrepreneurs. And, and then we met one time in Paris. Uh, we had a nice coffee in a traditional uh, coffee place. And then we walked through some strikes, of course. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah, that was quite funny. And, um, and yeah, you know all my colleagues before me before so yeah pretty interesting i think it's a small world anyway i think i'm sure you know some of the guests that i interviewed before uh so yeah really excited to have you um and yeah maybe uh we can start uh i'll invite you to introduce yourself who you are where you come from where you are where you are right now and what do you currently do for sure. Um, thanks so much for having me and thinking of me. Um, it's been it's been a couple of years since we met, and I think uh, both of us has grown a lot since then. I'm really glad to see both of us really um, doing fulfilling things and enjoying the work we do. Um, a little bit more about me. Um, over the last few years, I've been working at the intersection of impact and finance um, and entrepreneurship. Um, and my journey really started um, in... Um, during a, a career break, which I took back in 2016, where I had the opportunity to travel across South and Southeast Asia for a couple of months. Um, and during this period of time, I visited some of the largest and smallest social entrepreneurs and social enterprises across um, the region. Um, so I had the opportunity to live with these people, to see the work they were doing, whether it was in slums and villages, in on trains even. Um, and... I was really inspired by the work they were doing and wanted to contribute. 
Um, and, and since then, I started Gift Funds after meeting my co-founder um, in India on, on the same train, actually, as um, Din Long earlier mentioned, um, just two years prior, back in 2016, um, where, where we started with really the idea of supporting small to medium-sized social entrepreneurs across rural areas, tier three, tier four cities in India, because that's what we believe. We believe in our investment thesis is very much that some of the most impactful social entrepreneurs are the ones in big cities um, and, you know, going through the usual rounds, talking to investors. They're the ones hits to the ground, doing the work in the local communities, designing solutions and working with the local communities. Um, so I started this journey about four and a half, five years ago. Um, Give Funds was started about four years ago, which is that impact fund, which I mentioned earlier. Um, over the last two years, I've been taking a step back to really look and work at a macro level. So I spent some time with the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. Um, I'm doing some consulting work for impact funds as well as foundations. <clears throat> and I'm currently based in the UK. Cool. So thank you for your very comprehensive intro. Um, well, come back to everything that you said. Um, but before I... So uh, actually, there's so many questions I want to ask you. Uh, so I, I don't know which one to start with. I, I really I have so many questions, but maybe the first one sure. is... Um, you are, right now, you are doing two masters in Oxford, which, you know, when we, we think about it, it's quite impressive. Um, how oh, depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on which, yeah, how, <laughs> how you live the experience. Um, but yeah, and so at the same time, uh, I've read many of the interviews that you have uh, given before, and I've always seen in that, you know, you, you speak about your dyslexia. I'm not sure if I correct this word correctly, dyslexia, that it yes. played a big part in your story. And that, you know, when you started, uh, I mean, that, you know, it, it's, it, it's not really, like we're speaking about a different kind of how you learn at school. Like you, because from what I understood, you went to two different schools. I mean, not at the same time, but like throughout the year where one school was yeah. more adapted to how you could learn. Um, well, I think I lost myself, but yeah, just to say, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, like I was wondering, you know, because I, I didn't know this part of the story. And, you know, when, when you see two masters from Oxford, you might think, oh, wow, this guy, you know, he's academic excellence. He's, you know, he's always been the first in class. Um, well, it wasn't the case when you were younger. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I will be happy to share a little about that. Um, I think when I was younger, I really didn't do well in school. Um, and a large part of that was due to dyslexia. Um, I think my dyslexia itself, um, fortunately, wasn't very, very severe, but um, it, it was difficult enough to learn using the conventional academic system in Singapore um, because of, how, of the way I think. I think the easiest way I like to explain this is that I think dyslexics see the world in images and in pictures in, in, rather than in words, which other people would see the world. Um, allegedly, I don't know how other people think, <laughs> but... Um, that, that, that's what studies kind of have shown. And because of that, um, the way we learn, it's very, very different, um, which is just not suitable with the way education is conventionally being taught in Singapore. Um, I think over the years, I've um, gone through all the different phases from you know, frustration and anger at it um, to really accepting it and, and recognizing it for its strengths and, and the kind of um, abilities, a very, very different set of abilities which it gives me. Um, I think it's allowed me to see the world in a very, very different way. Um, it's allowed me to build and draw connections in, in very different ways. And perhaps also is a reason why um, today I'm really interested in systems change and um, systems work um, because of that ability to see different um, and break down complex problems into its elements and also seeing the relationships between them and identifying levers of change. Um, and so I think it's been a journey since my early days and thinking how I think about my dyslexia as well as how I reckon with it and how I've been managing and leveraging it. Um, but I think today I'm very like comfortable 
with it um, and understanding the kind of uh, strengths it has, but also some of the weaknesses which I need to, which, which I understood with it um, and in myself as well through dyslexia. Yeah. How did you manage to turn it into a strength, as you said? Because, you know, when we are young, we want to fit in. Uh, we don't know that other We, we just know the conver conventional education system. We don't know like other things exist. Um, and I, I guess like you need a lot of maturity also to, you know, step back and understand actually this can be a strength because I don't see the world like other people do. I'm unique. Uh, I want to celebrate this difference. But I guess how do you, did you manage to understand all of that? Um, I wouldn't say it was by any conscious means on my end, to be very honest. Um, I was really lucky throughout my educational period um, for various reasons that um, I think I managed to get through the most difficult part of education, which is really the part where you're, you're, you're learning and, you know, just memorizing things. And I think that happens generally in your earlier education years as opposed to application further down the line. Um, and so through various schemes, as well as through a lot of help from my parents and, and through great teachers and friends along the way, Um, I managed to kind of stumble through um, school without actually, you know, doing any permanent um, damage to my educational journey. Um, and by the time I think I started to, to re recognize the strengths and, you know, some of the things which I'm really good at compared to other things which I'm really bad at, um, I was able to shape my own journey by the time I hit like, um, I think, um, high school or so. Um, and that's, that's when there was a bit more focus on application. Um, and I had already identified some areas which I did relatively well in and also gravitating towards. Um, it really, like hindsight's 2020 20 and it's easy to craft a great story. But to be very honest, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in school at all back then. Um, I'll, I, I barely paid attention to grades. I, I, I failed through a lot of things, um, but somehow managed to make it through by, um, you know, force of will by my parents or <laughs> uh, the peer pressure to study or whatever that else that is. Yeah. So what were you interested in back then? Um, just going out really, um, you know, <laughs> spending time with friends, uh, you know, singing songs, uh, playing games. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's, will give a lot of hope to all the children who are playing games now and like their parents are saying, <laughs> stop playing games. Maybe they will end up in Oxford. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I wanted also to understand because, um, I mean, well, I think one very good thing about your journey, I mean, of course, when we retrospect and connect the dot, dots backwards is... I mean, I, I think you studied finance or you wanted to work in finance, something like yes. that. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and then and later on, you connected it uh, with the world of yes. social impact and social entrepreneurship. I mean, I'm happy to share a little on that if, that, um, if that's what, uh, if, if that would help give some additional context. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. No, may I, yeah. I mean, um, yes, we'll come to that. Um, yes. uh, but uh, yeah. Um, But before that, I wanted to ask, so like, so you joined university already with the will to work in finance? Oh, that came a bit later. I think, so in Singapore, we have mandatory military service. So we had to spend two years in the military. Um, and I think I was quite fortunate during that time to be able to, to, to explore. Um, and I think during that time, I really, two areas really stood out to me as really interesting. One was um, finance or rather investing. Um, and I'm a value investor. And, um, and since, ever since that period of time when I was learning value investing, I thought, you know, um, investing was something really interesting to me. Um, I enjoyed analyzing companies and, and seeing things in a very contrarian way, um, which also, I guess, ties back to, to my dyslexia and how I saw the world. Um, and, and so there was really one element which was very, very Um, prevalent during that two years in military service. I was reading a lot of books. I think each year I covered about 100 to 120 books uh, during those two years. Wow. Um, and I was, you know, investing and all of that. And I think towards the latter half of that, I got really interested in entrepreneurship. Um, to be very honest, at the start, it was just to make money. 
Um, but after a while, I really got to enjoy the process of building and understanding problems and creating solutions to it. Um, and and so I, I started, failed a whole bunch of times. In fact, majority of my ventures had failed um, before kind of landing on an ad tech startup with my best friend from high school, um, where we saw a gap in the education market, specifically providing workshops in Singapore uh, to students. And we saw that as right for di- disruption. And for us, it was, you know, how can we bring technology? How do we bring interesting um, technologies and ideas into the workshop and put them together in a nice package for these students? Um, and, and there was really a lack of innovation in the space. Um, this was back in 2014 when we started um, in, in Vineo. Um, 20, yeah, and, and, and then we... By 2015, I think that's when we got our first few contracts. Um, we started to give workshops to schools. We incorporated um, different technologies like VR back then. Um, I mean, to be very honest, it's just like Google Cardboard. This was back in 2015 and it just wasn't around at all. It wasn't, wasn't prevalent. Um, and, and really the idea was how can we help students learn better? Um, we were doing quite well, quite fortunately, but... I think I reached a point in time where I realized that I was doing it mostly because it was a great opportunity um, rather than something I was truly passionate about and passionate of making a difference in. Um, and that, was, that kind of led me to, to my journey, which you alluded to earlier on finding myself and moving into social impact and connecting the dots, looking backwards. So to come back to a bit before in Venio, so you said you started a few ventures, I mean, that failed. But how, yeah. how many ventures did you try? I have no idea, actually. Um, one was, I think, we tried doing financial inclusion by teaching people how to invest um, through video. So we interviewed a whole bunch of professionals. I think another one was trying to sell nutritional products um, at scale. So how, to, how, how can we deliver um, a subscription plan for nutritional products? Um, or rather, um, vitamins come whole bunch of nutritional products together on a, on a monthly basis as a subscription plan. Um, there was one for the elderly where we wanted to help um, engage those in nursing homes um, mentally and um, physically um, and trying to bridge the gap between um, the elderly as well as the like, you know, younger children um, to create more of it. In Singapore, we call it a kampong spirit, like, a more of community spirit among the elderly and, and, and to, to share their life experiences. Um, I can't really remember the rest, but I remember there was just so many things which we tried. We, we were really like, you know, creating MVPs, just prototyping, try something out. Um, um, you know, they say, you know, throw, throw enough shit at the wall and see what sticks. And that, that was literally what I was doing back then. Um, I mean, looking back, it was, I learned a lot, um, I think I made a whole bunch of mistakes and most of them wouldn't have worked out <laughs> at all. And, and they didn't. Yeah. But you, I mean, it, it's great. It, you were very entrepreneurial already. Um, like how come, you know, I also, so I think recently there was a study, very famous study that said Singaporeans are the least entrepreneurial <laughs> youth in, in Asia. So yeah. I'm wondering like, how come, you know, like not ev- how old were you? Uh, the- um, I was, so this was in 2014, I was 20, I think, 20, 21. Yeah. So yeah, you know, uni students who are 20, uh, not yeah. many people can say they tried four ventures and failed. Uh, yeah. Like why? Is it just because you read a lot of books about startups <laughs> or is it something else? I think there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, one was I read a lot of books about entrepreneurship. I think that was when entrepreneurship was really booming and in Singapore, um, it was also that, you know, I had nothing to lose, frankly speaking. Like, it's not like I, I had to support a family. It's not like I to support myself at that part of time. Um, I was in uni. Um, why not just try something uh, and, and see where it kind of takes me? Uh, and that's basically what I did. Yeah. Well, I, st- I still find it crazy you now because, I mean, you know, it makes perfectly sense uh, to say it now. But, you know, me, I, well, when I was 20, 21, I never had these ideas in my brain. It would have never come to my mind to do that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, for me, I, I find it impressive. And, of course, I mean, 
I mean, that's the best thing to do as a student because you learn so much from all your mistakes, uh, yeah. which brought you to Invino, later Giffens. Um, like there was no like role model, like someone who inspired you to do that, or it just you just were more mature, I guess. Um, I actually, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I there were no models. I think I was reading a lot of books on entrepreneurship. I think of like you know, the the Silicon Valley tech um, entrepreneurs and founders, um, and this was back in the day before I think. Um, there was more critical lens on entrepreneurship and tech um, back in the heydays. And I think um, it just got caught up in the momentum of things. Mm. Um, even though I, I think later on, I, I found out that that wasn't quite what was motivating me or what drives me. Um, it was just, you know, interesting work. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't know my purpose. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know anything really. Um, and so um, I was really trying to find my footing and trying to to understand um, my place in the world. Yeah. Mm. And another thing that I find interesting is you you said a couple of times it was just to make money, quote quote. But you know, describe you you just describe the businesses you tried. Yeah. It's it was okay. You, you mentioned you know engaging elderly people in elderly homes, imp- helping students to learn doing financial, I mean, it could be worse, you know, in terms of <laughs> just to make money. Uh, and yeah. I also saw that you've started this, uh, you know, student organization for um, the Dyslexia Association of, oh, yes, oh, it's a long yeah. name, but you, you are still, you know, trying to have an impact, I, I would say. Right? Yeah, I think deep down, I was trying to find my purpose and what I wanted to do. Um, for the rest of my life, or at least going forward. Um, and I wanted to be of value. Um, and I, I don't think I consciously knew it then. Um, and also, I, I don't think I really consciously found out that I needed to to really put myself out there to find my purpose um, until until I reached that kind of impasse with in video and scaling and realizing that, you know, in the midst of growing, there wasn't something which I really wanted to do long term. So actually, you left in Vigno while it was going well. Yes, uh, I think my co-founder and I we left, um, even though we knew that there was a lot of sales on the contract uh, on the horizon. Um, the industry was really ripe for disruption, and we were getting a lot of, um, you know, we, we we were growing really quickly. Um, I think we hit. We broke even within the first three months and we reinvested everything. Um, and sales were growing like 20, 30% uh, month on month. Um, very, very much like a high growth startup in that sense. Um, and we wanted to move from just, you know, providing workshops to actually creating workshop toolkits um, and selling that and developing a, a product of our own to, to educate better. Um, and but I think more like you, you guys were not aligned with the company's purpose anymore. Yeah, I think we we both saw it as a market opportunity that there was a gap in the market, <clears throat> and it was very easy to enter it. Um, but I think as we did it, we realized that you know this form of education just wasn't like our calling, um, and neither were we creating tremendous amounts of value. To be very honest, we were making workshops fun, we were teaching it in a better and more innovative way, but we weren't. Students weren't coming up our workshop and being like, you know, this changed how I saw the world mm. or this changed what my direction. Um, I mean, it's easy to sell like VR goggles and stuff and VR workshops to, to teachers back in the day, as well as bringing a more, a new interesting flavor to the market, a very, very different flavor to the market. Um, especially if you, you know, if, if we gamify the workshops, um, if we create storyboarding and we create, and we bring all these pe- uh, methodologies and pedagogies into into the into the education system, which currently wasn't there among uh, workshop providers. Um, it was it was it was it was just an industry just begging to be disrupted, I guess. <laughs> um, and and we took that, op- that as an opportunity rather than as something which we we were really passionate about. Um, yeah, and my co-founder then moved to Canada. Um, I think I, I was handling the business and just realizing that, you know, that was 
it wasn't something I would like to do going forward, um, mm-hmm. at least for the next, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years of my life until we can get, actually get an exit. So, so you, like, did you try to sell the company or you just left like this? We tried to find somebody to take over who was interested and passionate, but we couldn't find someone appropriate, whether it's, you know, the lack of interest or lack of understanding or passion for the business. Um, and I think we were still a little too early stage to start it off too. Um, it's not like we had really long standing contracts um, with, with, with schools. We had to basically pitch and sell every contract, even if we might get it on a year on year basis re- on a recurring revenue basis. It wasn't a recurring sales basis. It wasn't that attractive. We haven't moved. We were still very much service providers rather than creating a product. Mm. Um, and so we were just at this point where we we're like, you know what? It's fine. Um, we learned a lot. We're quite happy that it, you know, it was, is doing well. Um, but I think we need to, to walk away. Um, <laughs> wouldn't quite compare it to the walk away from, Only last, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's what I think we, my co-founder and I, we, we agreed on and I think we wanted to do, we, we had to do. Yeah, it's, I mean, for me, uh, from my external point of view is like you tried so many things to find a bit your direction, as you said. And I mean, and, and the first things that you try were to start adventures and it didn't work out in the for your objective to find your direction and that you you try to backpack which was another way to find yourself i mean it's what i understand you know from your yeah life. yeah um how like what why was backpacking another way to this i mean it was really yeah. with a purpose to discover yourself or it was just Yeah, everyone is backpacking. Let's just backpack. <laughs> um, the funny thing is that I think in Singapore, backpacking doesn't have that big a culture. Um, and I had no plans to really backpack either. Um, I think it was just at that point of time when I was quite lost and I didn't know what to do with InVideo um, that I, I, the opportunity to go to Unis Center in Bangladesh came up to spend a month there to learn about social entrepreneurs and social businesses. Um, I had no idea really what social entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurship really was. Uh, but I was like, since I was quite lost anyway, and this is a great you know, time to take a break to, to just kind of gather my thoughts. Why don't I just head to Bangladesh uh, for a month? Um, and everyone thought I was insane, but because <laughs> I've never been overseas, or I've never worked overseas for like a month in a place like that ever before. Um, and, and I didn't know a single person there. Um, funny thing is that the moment I, I landed in Bangladesh, um, I basically got scammed <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> um, and, and so <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a long story, but, <laughs> uh, but, and, uh, but, but, but I think, I think it was really, you know, let's take a month off and figure things out. And I think that month extended to three months. It extended to, to six months. It extended all the way to like eight, nine months or so. Um, really capping off. I mean, I bounced back to Singapore every, um, every few months or so just to settle a few things, repack and um, travel. Um, and then it kept off at the Yatra in India um, at the end of 2016, where I met my co-founder. Um, and I think at that point of time, it was, you know, I had the opportunity to live with so many of these social entrepreneurs, whether it's in villages, whether it's on farms, and they were the kindest people around. They would, they would, you know, travel three hours just to fetch me from the nearest city um, to their village or to their farm um, to let me live with them, to see the work they're doing, um, to live with their families, to eat with their families. Um, and it just blew my mind that some of these social entrepreneurs were, were changing hundreds thousands of lives um, while running profitable, impactful businesses. Um, and, and, and I think deep down back then, I knew that I, I wouldn't ever be able to create something like that. Uh, I just had too much ambition for the work they were doing and the kind of local innovations which they had. They understood that community so well and the solutions were so well tailored and designed to the communities. They was like, you know, unless I actually embed myself in the communities for years, I would never understand it 
in the same way or design solutions which are that that well fitting. Um, so the next best thing I could do was support them. Um, and I think that that kind of translated over to our ethos in, in gift funds where really everything is revolving around social entrepreneurs and the work they're doing. Um, and we as capital providers are just servicing, serving them to help them create a greater impact. Actually, you, you continue to travel until you didn't need to travel anymore. Right. Yes. Like until yeah. you found your answer. I mean, it's yeah. like we're in a cult, but until you found your answer. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's funny because now it sounds so obvious, you know, it, yeah, it's finance, what you were studying. Yeah. Social impact. Um, Entrepreneurship and kind of tying all of it together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny how you always have turning points in South Asia for some reason. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's serendipity or something like that. I think perhaps I, I yeah, I have, I have no idea. I think I think that's just just life. I guess um, the dots just connect for you. The universe aligns in a very, very, very unique and special way when things go right. When I think over that those months, I I didn't care about you know what I wanted to do in the future. I was very much living in the moment and living. Um, and learning from these people, I was very curious. Um, and somehow, you know, the the more or the further away I came, I, I I went from you know being very adamant of finding myself and my purpose and everything. Um, the clearer that got. Um, yeah, it's 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 strange. I'm I mean, just reflecting about the over the last few years. Every year, my direction would change completely, and I had no idea what I was going to do for next year. Oh, I had great plans for the next year and next few years, but every year that changes. Um, but at the same time, it changes in really, really wonderful ways, and um, I'm still constantly learning a lot. I'm incredibly grateful for that. And so you met this this guy, uh, so your co-founder in in the train. Um, I think you, you told me that you met him, and it was you had the same sort of drive. To, to, to bridge capital opportunities to these grassroots entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, how, I mean, so how, how like, yeah, how, how did everything start? I mean, so like how I met you, just bumped into him in the train. And to be very honest, so I only had one conversation with him, I think, um, among that 15, 16 days. I think I had a conversation on like the second last day or something like that. Um, and we just introduced each other and that's it we didn't have any strong impression of each other. We had no idea that we, we had no plans to talk about starting a business together. Um, in fact, he's about 12 years older than I am. And so he was really quite successful by the time I met him. Um, having started an investment banking consultancy, he started a slum school as well. Um, and, and he wanted to spend a lot of his time giving back, uh, having been quite fortunate and having been given quite a lot and been quite ses- relatively successful. Um, and so I actually wanted to talk to him about being a mentor because I was like, you know, I wanted to support these social entrepreneurs. I've raised funds in the past. Um, you know, I, I probably could try raising funds for these social entrepreneurs, but um, I had no idea how the local context works. Uh, I had no idea how um, entrepreneurship really works in these areas and the, the cultural context and how to move money in and out of these places. And here was some fellow who, who understand, understood how to move money in and out of the country, how to invest in social enterprises, or rather invest in SMEs, um, as well as worked in the social impact space with and starting a slum school as well. Um, and I want to about as a mentor to just you know guide me in my, my journey. Um, and so after the, after the train trip, I added him on LinkedIn. We talked after that. We had calls. And I think one call just led to the next because... I think some, the, the problems which we saw were so aligned. Um, and I think he was, he was also looking to do something more with his set of finance skill sets as well as understanding of impact sector beyond just, you know, starting a slum school and finding the funds to, 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 to finance it. He wanted to do something more. Um, and I think over the next three months or so, we spoke every other day or every few days. I mean, this is bearing in mind, he has his own family, he has his own business and everything. Uh, but I, I think it really, you know, we really saw that the problems were there. It wasn't going away. There was nobody solving it. Um, and, and if not, if nobody else is, then 
I think we had an obligation to actually try solving them ourselves. Um, and so I think it was only about half a year after the Yatra, I think May or June um, 2017, that we actually came together and we're like, you know, we got to do something, let's start something and let's see where this takes us and see how we can help these social entrepreneurs. Yeah. And what, so, and then, so after the six months, where were you? Uh, so after like the Yatra, you went back to Singapore, I guess, or you stayed in India? Oh, no, after the Yatra, I went back to Singapore for a bit. Um, I went to the US again to work for a little. Um, I was doing some work with startups there. I was mainly helping them to raise funds um, as well as get their, you know, cap tables and accounting and stuff in order during the, for the due diligence for during the fundraising rounds. Um, and I think I was, I was calling him actually from the Bay Area um, in, 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 in the US. Um, and I think by the time we hit, you know, June, July or so, um, I think we, we were quite committed to starting something together. We got into an accelerator program in Singapore as well as one or on track to winning a few awards. Um, and, and then I chose to come back, go back to Singapore to work on it. Um, and then head to India after that to, to, to work on it and to really, um, get our product market fit, right. And understanding the ecosystem. So I think from really, I think from the end of my backpacking at about, you know, 2016 to when we actually started giving out our, uh, uh, our first um, investment was um, in early 2018. So it took us over a year to really understand the market incredibly well, to understand the gaps in the market, to understand the different players, their relationships to each other, their intentions and their incentive structures. Um, and in doing so, helping to find the gap and try to connect the dots and connect the pieces in that way. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think the problem you are addressing is very, I mean, I say important, but it's a bit broad, but like, you know, very, I have to say it, like, yeah, important. I cannot find another word. A uh, wicked but problem. It, because, yeah, big, yeah, I mean, because like what I understand is, you know, the like social entrepreneurs from the big cities, are more exposed to capital funding opportunities, uh, very grassroots uh, like social enterprise, they might have access to microfinance. But what happens to social entrepreneurs who are in, in between? Yeah. They are too big for microfinance institutions, they are not sexy enough for impact investor or whoever, like, you know, uh, yeah. whoever. So you, you arrive there in the middle, um, yeah. But then it's also so complicated because it's India. There's like one point five four billion people. Yeah. Every state is different, so you have to navigate everything as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you're yeah, absolutely right. I think when we first we knew the problem which we wanted to solve, we just didn't know how to solve it whatsoever. Because how do you reach these social entrepreneurs at grassroots level who are doing great work um, at scale and at low enough cost? There's a reason why there was a pioneer gap and it still remains unfilled at that point of time because nobody could crack that market. Nobody knew how to reach them and find out whether they're genuine, whether they're really impactful, whether or not they're financially sustainable. Um, when, you know, these social entrepreneurs don't need much capital. They need anything where between, you know, five to $200,000 and that's it. And it's just not worth the due diligence costs to, to source for these social entrepreneurs and to find them. Um, but they're also some of the most incredible solutions. And so it was really a blue ocean for us, really there for the taking, but um, nobody else could crack it. And, and we did not know how to crack it at all. So I think that that year really understanding the market really helped a lot. I think eventually what we ended up settling on was that we realized that there were these community nodes, which today we call network partners, um, who are embedded in local communities. And you can think of them like, you know, nonprofits who help social enterprises. They are, um, market access providers who work with cooperatives in rural areas. They are accelerators, they're incubators. They are um, companies who help social enterprises or, net or market builders who help social enterprises. Um, and these organizations, it turns out, have really close relationships with those at a grassroots level. They really understand what's happening. They understand the kind of problems being solved and they understand the commitment levels of these social entrepreneurs. In some cases, they even have financial information on these social entrepreneurs. And we were like, 
you know, it doesn't make sense for us to understand these social entrepreneurs again when we have these people who've been working these social entrepreneurs hand in hand for years. Why don't we just use the knowledge, the relationships, and the understanding they have, as well as the communities around these social entrepreneurs and what they have, um, to actually immediately tap into these communities and invest in these social entrepreneurs, um, which is basically what we did. So immediately, like the moment we saw things from that different perspective, things clicked. Like immediately we, we found that there were pools of these social entrepreneurs across the country, um, which we could work with very closely. Um, these were people who, who understand local problems very, very well um, and have data on them. And so using these pools, we then collected data from the local communities. Um, in fact, we collect for each social enterprise, on average, we collect about six to seven different data sources from different data sources, um, 80 to 100 data points. In fact, I think now it's more, probably about 120, 140 data points uh, for each social entrepreneur before we make a decision. But because we could automate that entire process, because we had local community buy-in and we understood the, 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 the community's perspective, we didn't need to send somebody down. Some, somebody down. We didn't need to talk to them in fancy terms like Tam Sam Soms, what's their market sizing, what's their go-to-market strategy, what's their you know, unit economics and all of that. We, we still eventually would touch on that, um, especially on subsequent rounds of funding. But for the first round of funding, there's so much community validation, there's so much understanding, there's so much trust baked into that sourcing process that it wasn't really necessary. Mm. And yeah, so that's, that's interesting. That's how you cracked the, I mean, one part of the, one part of your activity, which is more like on the deal flow side, but yeah. there's the other side, I guess, which is more on like attracting funding. Yes. Um, so that, did, did you have a night? Because I think, like uh, the, the one year in India was really to understand how to reach and identify local solutions at scale um, that you cracked it. Yes. But on the other side, did you have an idea or was it also something to understand? Yes. Um, I think when we started to understand the funding landscape, we realized that, you know, most impact investors, they have really high hurdle rates. So they, they basically have very high re return requirements from social enterprises. Um, and, and philanthropy itself, especially in India, one wasn't willing to take interesting and new risks. And two, um, they had no idea how to go about it. Um, but we saw a gap there because a lot of these impact investors, ironically, because of how high their standards are and because they only are sourcing from a very limited group of social enterprises. Um, they have problems finding pipeline. They have problems finding good social enterprises to invest in. Um, and, he, and, and on the other hand, for, for philanthropy and for, for, for donations, whether it's CSR or foundations or family offices, they wanted to deploy the capital to create more impact. How do you measure that impact over time? How do you, how do you quantify it? How do you have evidence base around it? Um, and, and to maximize the kind of limited resources which they have. And, and so we saw that, we saw how things were being done, but we also saw the intentions and the incentives. And the question for us was how do we pluck that? So for most of our social entrepreneurs, we are the first and only funder, and we see ourselves as a catalytic investor providing flexible capital. Catalytic being, you know, we're usually the first and only funder in our social enterprises. And flexible capital being we provide capital at much lower rates of return than other impact investors. But in doing so, we actually are able to source for many social enterprises, which are otherwise missed by these investors. And then we can actually pass on these deals over to investors at a later stage when these social enterprises are ready for funding, um, which would then allow us to roll over the capital back to newer social enterprises um, at a smaller scale and, and kind of hand them off, so to speak, towards larger investors and larger rounds of funding. Um, so that was our tie-in with the existing impact investor community. Um, and for the foundation set of things, um, we were able to get really granular and impactful data, which is otherwise not possible at the rural and grassroots level. So how could we use it using our impact measurement system and impact rating and valuation system to be able to quantify it to them and say, you know, this is data which you just can't get at a portfolio level, um, especially it, across a whole range of different interventions across different sectors. 
we have social enterprises working all over India, from UP to Bihar to Maharashtra to to um, Karnataka, and all these places are uh, have have very bad data quality. And even if they do have data, it's unstructured data. So how can we help them to report better and to show, hey, our intervention and the work we're doing is actually a lot more impactful than the traditional um, outlets which they actually donate to. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy to work between different fields and different stakeholders like this. I mean, it's been incredibly difficult and we're still in the mid, there's a lot of education required in this process. Um, as opposed to just convincing, um, understanding, uh, uh, changing how people see philanthropy, uh, changing how people see impact investments. But I think when we were understanding the space, there was a necessary gap which needed to be f- filled. Um, it was a lever of change, which I think if we put in effort there, would create an outsized ripple and, um, across the sector um, if we're successful. And I think we're still really far from that, but um, we've, We've been quite fortunate to support some incredible social enterprises and been quite fortunate to do some interesting work. You don't consider yourself successful yet? No, I, I think the mark of success for us would really be when we are obsolete, when there's no pioneer gap because there's enough people and competitors in the market. And I think we're so far from that. Um, like in, in India, there's estimated about 2 million or so social enterprises Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but um, about 80 of them gets funded every year. That's one in every 25,000. We haven't changed anything there. I think even if we do 100 deals a year, a few hundred deals a year, um, or a few thousand deals a year, that's not enough to fund enough impactful social enterprises. Granted, not all of them will be venture-backed and very sexy and all of that, but at least getting access to funding, whether it's debt capital, whether it's other forms of flexible capital, whether it's patient capital, this is necessary to actually help these social enterprises to scale and to reach their visions. And to be honest, this is also, I think one of the, I'm quite convinced that it's one of the best ways to, to change lives and create impact, supporting these people. What, what is, what do you need to increase your scale? Or like, what is your bottleneck? Like, do you need more community partners? Do you need more funding? Do you need, Both? Do you need better automation? Do you need more staff? I think we are at a pivotal moment for gift funds. Wherein I think so. When we first started, we very much worked with philanthropic capital. Or rather, we when we first started, we worked with our own capital, and then we raised a bit of philanthropic capital. Um, wherein we take an acumen like model, wherein we we raise philanthropic capital, we put it in a revolving fund essentially, and then we basically revolve that fund. So we give low cost loans out, the loans come back in, and then we give it out again. Um, it was great for proving our model and helping us to reach where we are today. I think what we realized is that to really scale and to solve this problem, we need to move to the next level. That means attracting private sector capital. And that means creating new products and services, which have already the benefits of what we had previously in terms of cost, in terms of robustness, in terms of, you know, the ability for them to repay this capital. So we've had zero NPLs to take, so zero defaults across 60 or so deals, um, which we're really, really surprised by, but again, not very surprised by as well because these social entrepreneurs are simply the best ones across the country. Um, but yet at the same time, to actually solve this problem, private capital has to come in, uh, return-seeking capital has to come in, and products has to be designed to be aligned with impact for these kinds of of capital. So it can't be a typical venture-backed model where I'm taking equity stake and, and expect them to exit within eight years um, and to scale and solve the, all the problems within eight years. That just doesn't happen, especially in social impact space when you're solving real wicked problems. Um, so how do you create new products? And we've been experimenting in, with them and we continue to experiment with them. So I think we We're actually weighing between revenue-based financing models as well as um, outcome contracting and outcome-based models, um, such as social success nodes um, within gift funds. And I think if we're able to crack that, we're able to open kind of the floodgates in that sense and get a lot more private capital to the market while changing the investment process from a very boutique um, individual process um, to an automated process, very much like how, you know, Henry Ford changed 
into a production line. We want to change investments into a production line. We want it to be boring. Uh, we want it to be low cost, boring, very mundane, and it's the same thing minted over and over again. And if we can do that at scale, that will solve a lot of things. But I think from where we are right now, our current product mix has given us a lot of information, a lot of data to work with, um, and to really catch up and exceed best practices internationally on impact funds um, and do a lot more deals. But going forward, I think we need to tweak this model to change incentive structures to be aligned with social enterprises and their growth models in order to really help them reach the next level and to attract a lot more capital into the space. Um, yeah. Is that the, like the, I've seen a term before, which is missing middle. Yes. I think it applies to, okay. Is it a niche? I mean, is it a challenge, a gap that you identified in other countries or is it only in India or did you identify it in other countries also? Yes. Um, I think it's really a problem identified globally. Again, I'm more familiar with South and Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, numerous reports have shown it globally. In terms of Southeast Asia and the rest of South Asia, it's very much a problem. Um, in 2018 itself, I spent most of the year overseas really traveling and living in these local communities. So I hopped across you know, Vietnam, Burma, um, or Myanmar, Thailand, um, Philippines, Indonesia, to really embed myself in local communities, to understand them. I spent you know, one, two months in each place. Um, and talk to the stakeholders to understand the same problems, like very much what, like what I did in India when we started. Um, I don't know, was this 2019? 2018 or 2019, I forgot. <laughs> but um, I very much saw the same problems. Um, there was a pioneer gap and a massive missing middle. Um, and there was basically nobody solving it. There was very, very few people solving it. Impact investing was still nascent at that time in Southeast Asia. And a lot of them were taking very similar venture uh, capital models. You know, typical 220 models, impact investors were only incentivized to create financial returns, only incentivized to push for exits. Uh, very typical 10-year funds, um, close-end funds, um, and with really high hurdle rates um, and expected IRRs. They're looking at, you know, 20 25%. In fact, in some cases, 30 35%. Um, which basically results in an exit multiple you expect from a social enterprise. So you expect to earn maybe 60, 70, up to even 150x for each social enterprise for every dollar you invest in um, over that period of time, which is just ridiculous. So we've been speaking for one hour already. So I really want to ask you more questions about you now. <laughs> sure. uh, so there's one question I kept willing to ask you in my mind. Yes. You said in one interview, so I really, you said that during your first year of uni, you were working like 100 hours a week. <laughs> and then, but, but, and it's, well, I don't remember the exact term, but it's when you, you realized things about work-life balance, this kind of stuff. Yes. And started to decrease a bit your working hours time every year. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm wondering like, where are you at now? Uh, are you, did you find a good work-life balance? Looks like no, but <laughs> so, so wondering like, what have you learned like from the process? You know, all this process trying to improve your work-life balance, and are you satisfied now? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't remember saying that at all. Uh, I think I was probably quite wise, but I forgot. Uh, like many dyslexics, my memory is horrible. <laughs> so, uh, probably should heed that advice a little bit more. I don't think I'm at a hundred hours mark here. I'm probably, you know, between 60 to 80 hours um, a week now. Um, I do enjoy a lot of the work. Um, I'm getting a lot of fulfillment from it. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think minus like the last year, I think when when, when COVID hit, um, I think I've, I've become more mellowed. I think I think having work-life balance is incredibly important because it adds a lot of value to to kind of the work I'm doing. Um, it gives me energy makes me a lot more productive um, and being able to have hobbies and enjoyments outside um, really, really was helped a lot. Um, yeah. I, I think this year, in fact, that very, very much ties into kind of my commitments this year and my, my goals for this year, which is to kind of, you know, 
balance things out a little bit more as well. And, and um, among my different priorities in life, whether it's relationships um, with friends, family, loved ones, um, and, and, you know, things which I'm interested in, things I'm passionate about, um, as well as building that kind of portfolio or cocktail career going forward where I kind of want to have my hands in different honey pots and doing different things at the same time. Um, and, and yeah, so, so I, I, I very much agree with that. I think having greater balance is important. I don't think I'll reach that kind of 40 hours work week uh, anytime soon. But um, I think I'm in a good place, especially if I can move it down to about, you know, 60 hours a week or something. I think that's something which is quite healthy, at least for the next few years. Yeah. Did you set rules for yourself? Or are you following, or did you create a framework for yourself around work-life balance? Interesting. Yes, I, I, I did, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, I've started to put daily commitments. I've joined accountability groups for that. And one of my commitments was, you know, one hour before sleeping, I just don't touch work or um, the laptop at all. I, I shut everything off. Um, I might reply a few messages. I might read or whatever else, but nothing to do with work, emails, news, anything like that. Out. I try to reduce screen on time as well. Um, I'm starting to have breakfast <laughs> every day. <laughs> That's important to <laughs> Um, creating a morning routine, uh, reflecting daily, meditating daily, uh, being more mindful about things. Um, I think all of these things are like checklists which I kind of built up over time. And I think over the last two or three months, actually, I've become a lot more dedicated in actually following through with them um, and working on them. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, I have this these checklists and these... Um, these commitments on a daily basis on what I, what I do want to achieve to get greater balance um, as well as, you know, commitments on spending time with friends or relaxing. Um, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, th these are things which I'm still struggling to adopt, especially over the last few years, but um, I think last three months have been pretty good and I hope to continue this going forward. What is your morning routine? Um, so I would, wake up, have breakfast. Um, I'll do a bit of mindfulness in the morning. Um, and sometimes that includes a bit of breathing as well. Um, and that's basically it. Then and, and at night and that during that hour, I'll read for about half an hour. Oh, in the morning, I try to exercise. Um, the key word is try here. <laughs> <laughs> Still trying. But um, in, the, in the evening, I would then, you know, read. Um, I'll do reflection the day, the week. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I usually spend a lot more time reading now and being a little, little bit more deliberate about things um, and thinking through how the day went. Yeah. Um, trying to pick up a few hobbies as well, especially if lockdown now. <laughs> no, it's good. I think it makes me, what you say, makes me reflect, reflect on my own inexistent morning routine. I wake up and I check my phone. I mean, I snooze. Then when yes. I stop snoozing, I check my phone. Yes. Or in between yes. snooze, I, so it's very unhealthy. And I do the same before going to sleep. Um, I, I tried to have a checklist during the peak of COVID. I mean, the beginning during March yes. to... Yeah. I had, I had five, four or five checklist items. One was to sweep the floor. One was to put eye drops in my eyes. One yeah. was to play some piano and yeah. another was to do at least a seven minute workout. Yeah. Yeah. And I followed that for three weeks and then I <laughs> overnight I just I was like, fuck this, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so what I found really useful for me was the accountability group. And so creating a group, maybe you meet like once every week or once every two weeks or something. Um, and you just have like half an hour, an hour just to just to recap on what you've done in the past. Uh, maybe a bit, be a bit mindful during that time, share a bit of learnings and insights, and that's it. Um, in fact, if you throw money into the mix, that's even better. So you, you there know, is an app where you can you can put five dollars or something like this, and if you don't respect your commitment, they take it from you. 
Ah, yes, yes, yes. Something, but I mean, an app is one thing because you have to, you know, put it in again or something. But like when you have friends there and like peer pressure and stuff, that's really, really. I find that really, really useful. Um, as well as you can either win the pot or you know, mm-hmm. you end up if you if you're not committed to it, you end up buying everybody a meal. <laughs> so yeah. that 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 that. Well, I think that that might be the secret ingredient to to for people like me <laughs> to to. No, but yeah, I think I need to reinvent a bit my routines. I have literally no routine. Um, but I also don't dislike it. But yeah. I, th- I guess I need to see what the other world looks like, you know, to see if I benefit from it or if yes. maybe I will be more unhappy and it's fine. People don't need to follow routine, but exactly. it's good yeah. for many people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so I, I, now I want to ask you three questions that are my favorite ones that I yeah. always ask to my guests. Uh, the first one is, wait, so, uh, wait, you, you said you are 26, right? 27. 27. Okay. Yeah. So if you could, you know, go back in time, meet the Edward of 18 years old and yeah. tell him something, would you tell him something? And if yes, what would you tell him? I would say relax a bit more. Um, the universe will align. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think so. I, I, I don't, and I mean, obviously, like I'm speaking from a position of massive privilege now, <clears throat> but I don't really regret a lot of the things which I've done. Um, even though at a point of time, I might be, might seem a lot very uncertain, um, probably put my life in danger a few times. Um, but yeah, I think it's don't be so worried about the future and kind of live a little bit more in the present. Um, the the future will sort itself out. The universe will align. Um, things will work out. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's a beautiful advice. But it's also a hard advice when you hear it, because you're like. What does this guy know? <laughs> but actually, no. it's true. Yeah. It will happen at some point yeah. without you even knowing that it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I probably need to take a bit of that advice myself these days as well. So. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's good. Yeah. It's like you, to remind yourself about it, write it on the wall or something. Yeah. Um, so we've, we, we, we have been talking a lot about the past, uh, about the present. Um, so I want to ask you this question about the future. Yes. Um, so how do you, how would you like people to know you for and remember you for? That's an interesting question. Huh? I think I've been having a lot of these qu- conversations quite recently. Um, and I go back to, I think, I think the, the best way I, 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 I know how to think about it was go back to, to a eulogy I wrote for myself which is funny because in Southeast Asia or in, in Singapore, people don't say eulogy. <laughs> it's not really a thing at all. A what? A eulogy? Uh, eulogy. So it's a eulogy is like, you know, when you die, somebody says oh, okay. new words and stuff about you. Um, and I wrote a eulogy about myself, I think back in 2017. So I could, you know, see like, you know, begin with the end in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, before going into the content, um, the funny thing is that that eulogy and the words in there hasn't really changed much. Like I revise it every few months. I'll take a look at it again to remind me. It doesn't really change over the years, despite, you know, every year my direction changing and me doing different things altogether. Um, I don't think I really want to be remembered. Um, in so much as looking back at life and be like, you know, that's a life worth living. Um, I think the few themes which came up in, in the eulogy, and I think one is impact. Um, the other is relationships, really treasuring and, you know, um, being a good friend, father, son, uh, um, a partner, um, husband or whatever else um and stories and really you know life being a bunch of stories put together and having interesting stories 
throughout life. And I think those three themes really came together um, quite, quite, quite well in my eulogy. And I think, I think that's, that's, if I look back on life, if, you know, how I want to live life, I think those three things are some are things which seem to have stuck around for the last, you know, four or five years or so. And I think, I hope we'll stick around until then. Um, but yeah, I, I think towards the end, I also said, you know, it's not, I don't want to be remembered. Um, but um, I mean, if people want to, to remember me, it's by why I did my, the work I did and to not, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and to maybe do, do similar work and similar motivations. Yeah. Would the content or the three main team, would it have, would, wait, my English, <laughs> no it's something that you would have, you could have written at 18, 22, or is it really something that emerged after 2016, after the Bangladesh, India trip? I think it's something which only emerged after 2016. Yes. And I think, I think impact just wasn't a big theme at all in my life. I think stories weren't a big theme either. And seeing, you know, a rich life being one filled with really incredible and interesting stories. Um, relationships wouldn't have been that high up either. I don't think I would have been mature enough back then. So I think, I think these three teams really came on the last like five years or so, um, five, six years or so. And, and I, they seem to be sticking around for a while. Yeah. Since you spoke about stories, um, I didn't plan to ask this question, but uh, now yeah. I will because it's <laughs> how you you might want to be known for. Um, but the first sentence in your LinkedIn bio is, do you remember? I think it's a, it's a misfit. <laughs> and... Yes, it's a misfit. Edward has served trains in Bangladesh, got treated to beers by transgender sex workers in Vietnam, and partied in Mexican cartel villages. <laughs> Could you share the story of the Mexican cartel village? <laughs> sure. Um, to be honest, it wasn't like, it isn't as dramatic as it sounds. Um, I was actually living in uh, an Airbnb and, and I was just speaking with my host. Uh, he was really, really kind as a person. We were just sharing stories. And he himself had cycled the Silk Road from Holland all the way to China. He spent a year doing that um, bikepacking, really. Um, he had a whole bunch of incredible stories and, and kind people and obviously also like um, really interesting and horrible experiences as well. Um, and as we were just sharing stories, he was like, you know, do you want to come to my village for a party? Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? What's the, what's the worst that could happen? Right. Um, and so we, we took, I think local buses, I think we changed like three or four times, uh, f like three hours outside of Mexico city. Um, and I landed there. I had no idea where I was. There wasn't any reception whatsoever. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what am I doing? I have no idea where I am. Uh, we went to his home and then after that we went to like a party in the forested area with a whole bunch of like local people. I was basically the only pe person outside of the village. Uh, not even like, you know, um, not even like Mexican. Um, and, and, you know, I think something came, came up along the way. Where we, uh, my host was like, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, the, 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 we're protected. Um, the authorities don't enter here. <laughs> <laughs> What, what's happening and you know if I if I just die over here I have no idea what's going to happen to me. nobody nobody knew I was in the village um, nobody probably cared I didn't know a single person in the country well uh, at all um, but um, it turns out to be to be great I, I think they were some of the most kind people everywhere they invited me to stay the night with them to to to, to have food with them um, and You know, because I, I had to fly the next day, so I had to go back to Mexico City. He, the Airbnb host actually took the bus with me until the last bus, two hours out, um, to see me on the last bus back into the city. And then he took the same bus, or the same buses, two hours back. So he basically wasted four hours just ferrying me to the last bus, <laughs> came back to, to, to the city. That's just like incredible. I was just like, wow. Um, yeah. That, that's what happened. <laughs> party was fun. 
Uh, so yeah, everyone, if you want to hear the story of the two others, reach out to Ed. I think he actually you can find the story of the Bangladesh in one interview. I let you guys look on Google. Um, my final question is: How would you describe yourself in three hashtags? Three hashtags. Well, that's tough. Um, I think I'm, I'm a little too old for hashtags. <laughs> well, we are the same age. Don't yeah. say that. <laughs> Don't you feel old? <laughs> I, I do. I do. Actually, these days I I feel very old. <laughs> uh, especially with all the young, like all, all the young people in Southeast Asia are doing such incredible work. I'm like shit. Exactly. Oh, oh. Exactly. That's why you know I feel like yeah. Whoa, whoa. When I was their age, I was not doing any anything. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, three hashtags. I would say. Wow. Okay, this is tough. Hatspa. What, what did you say? Hatspa. C H U T Z P A H. I think it's a Yiddish word. Um, the closest approximation to that. Is audacity. Okay. Um, in in English, it, it's a little bit more, but I think the closest is hatspa. Um, think the theme for the last year for me has been very much being more intentional about things. So I guess that's another one. Um, And perhaps the last one really would be you know, I guess lift experiences and, and the kind of the value which it provides. I think over the, the last mm -hmm. few years, the, the biggest recurring theme is kind of the value of lift experiences from people. And and realizing their importance, yeah. Cool. Never answered this question before, so. <laughs> yes, I ask you a question that no one asked you before. I'm happy. It took the, to the final question <laughs> to reach to reach this. Okay, uh, intentional lived experience and gazda, I think. Hatspa. Hatspa. Hats, okay. Oh, okay. Hatspa. All right, uh, and. Yeah, where, like, can, where can people reach out to you or find out more about your work, your thoughts? How can people support you if they can? Uh, sure. Um, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's Edward E. So that's E-D-W-A-R-D-Y-E-E. -E -E. um, that I'm always happy to accept invites. Just drop me a message or a note um, and be happy to connect. Um, otherwise, uh, you can check out more about gift funds at G-I-V-F-U-N-D-S dot O-R-G. Uh, so that's giftfunds.org. Um, or drop me an email at edward at giftfunds.com or dot org. Yep. Cool. Thank you so much, Edward, for this great conversation. I learned a lot about you, so I'm really happy. And yeah, it was great to understand a bit better the model of gift funds also. Um, And no, thank you so much. It was great uh, to catch up and to, and also like I, I did learn a, a cool few, a cool few, a few cool tips. Uh, you know the accountability group, um, and uh, actually I love asking myself like you know when I'm 80 or during my funeral, what would I want people to say about? Yeah, but the exercise of writing your. I forgot the word. Like your eulogy, yeah, 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 eulogy. And but and looking at it every year, I think it's interesting yeah. also. Uh, yeah. But no, thank you so much, Edward. Uh, people, reach out to Edward if you can, if you want to tell him that the episode was awesome, <laughs> and yeah, keep in touch. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it was a great privilege. Congrats for listening until the end of this episode. Of course, to best support Lifeline, you can share this episode to two of your friends and subscribe to the next episodes on any platform. See you next time.